Which talent? What talent? For what purpose? Law as a business versus law as a profession. The changing role of law school and law firm has therefore necessarily to be discussed as both the law firm and the law school have to cater to specific needs. The future is embedded in the past and the present. So one must change and model one's profession on the state of the legal industry. Therein lies the progress of the law student, that is the talent, the law school, and the law firm. The fourth limb, of course, is the client, as all this revolves ultimately around their needs. As the legal profession undergoes what are fundamental changes, cost pressures from clients, there will be a time when there would be a reduced need for associates. As a result of the technological tools and outsourcing, as well as the reduced market quality of life in the profession that has taken a hit. People have always worked hard in large firms, but working hard once meant something different. What did not have smart devices or clients in China and US emailing you at midnight and expecting an answer back in an hour. Students are now asking, even if I get a job, can I have a life? Is it going to be satisfying? Will I be secure? What is the competition with? There is no educational barrier to entry, no experience required to be an instant entrepreneur. As against that competition, one has to do a minimum five years of study to be qualified as a bear lawyer. And then of course, go in for LLM or solicitors or whatever post qualification, post graduation, uh, teaching or learning to become a practicing lawyer. Legal education is perhaps the costliest education after MBA education at prestigious institutions like the International School of Business. It is reported that entry at the ISB is about 28 lakhs for a single year, whereas the highest I know of is at the Jindal Law School, which is about seven and a half lakhs. In my times, law education cost me 900 rupees a year for three years. That is about $40 approximately for being professionally qualified to be a lawyer from a government law school. The situation is vastly different abroad where student loans and distress is legendary. There has been an attrition of the esteem once afforded to the legal profession and the current global consternation with the unholy trinity of COVID, the Ukraine-Russia war and inflation and global shortages which are going to escabarate this even more. Why should then one attend law school? One should attend law school now because of the technological advancement in the practice of law. It's going to be radically transformed like a business that has hibernated in relevant and relative dormancy for the last 400 years. From e-discovery and litigation analytic analytics to artificial intelligence and machine learning. There has never been a more exciting and dynamic time to be a member of the profession. The best law school experience does not confine students to a career of practicing law, but rather introduces them to the lifelong study of practicing life. There should not be a restriction on the teachings of a single perspective or advice that there is a solitary resolution to any problem. Instead, they should learn that the constantly evolving complexity of the modern world requires a holistic, comprehensive, and malleable solution to problem solving. What are the predictions for the legal function 
in the future? How is talent to be contextualized in the future of law? And that is ultimately dependent upon the changing role of the end consumer of law. The student can be an end consumer, the law firm can be an end consumer, and the client can be an end consumer. And therefore, all their perspectives have to be taken into account. By 2025, the regulatory environment is going to be far more complex. Pressure to cut costs is going to be an all time high, while standardization and automation will create routes, new routes to efficiency and insight. COVID-19 is not going to be wished away and it will ramp up all these challenges even more. The sudden move to remote work is also proof of concept for relying even more on connectivity, centralization, and technology. The role of in-house legal teams is changing quickly. The businesses that they support are going to be digital. What are the long-term outcomes of these accelerating changes? How are the forces shaping the legal function of tomorrow? And therefore, what are the discoveries that clients have come to? There are about eight or 10 mantras or uh, equations, as I would say. It. They foresee that half of the legal team will not be lawyers. The traditional legal function hierarchy will likely to be morphed into a more agile and cost-effective structure. Use of automated solutions, chat box, or other forms of productized legal services will increase. This will require more multidisciplinary workforce with different skill sets. Works of paralegals, data analysts, operational experts, and other specialists in the legal function might rise to a point where legal professionals become almost a minority. Secondly, the contract life cycle management will be the central source of truth for all contracts. Organizations have already done the work to centralize their finance and resource related activities within single systems, as well as their customer relationships and sales. Centralizing how they manage contracts from negotiation to execution and afterwards to termination is the key forward. Ultimately, the central key is the organizational ability to reduce costs, manage risk, and improve performance. Like regulatory change, for example, or litigation results will create the need to update masses of contracts and the terms of which have to be properly tagged. There will be no line between legal tech and tech. The line between enterprise technology and just tech will be blurred. Reading data will be as important as reading legal terms. Businesses are increasingly relying on their legal teams to help them identify opportunities to increase revenue and decrease cost and risk. There's a need to check how the contracts are performing and when it is time to end contracts or negotiate better terms. Legal data pools will get richer and analysis with a strategic insight will be in demand. And this is an opportunity to identify how to improve legal contracts. Legal teams will be measured on strict KPI such as the money they make for business. Law as a driver of financial results will be the norm. Client experience will be at the heart of legal delivery. How the client feels after the end of the delivery of the service is going to be so important that it will lead to the second round of legal work. A bad experience will mean no further work. All standardized legal work will be permanently subsumed into the business. All legal, legal processes which are not bespoke will be automated and self-service enabled. Contract processing will go completely online, slashing the time to complete, complete details. More importantly now, 
managing culture and shifting mindsets will be essential the cultural aspect of a law school or the cultural aspect of a law firm are going to be very significant in the way forward with legal operating models undergoing tremendous change it is important to recognize the amount of potential effort that needs that is needed for success whether when they are installing new technology or refining a process or organizing the need to devote enormous energy in terms of resources budget and time taken to actually get things off the ground to drive successful legal operating models built on continuous innovation and improved legal teams will be needed for a huge shift in the mindset across the organization they need to arm themselves with new skills and their leaders will need to demonstrate their commitment to realize transformation benefits putting implementation in the hands of a dedicated change management team championed my management will be critical a legal chief operations office will be just as important as the general counsel's office it is expected that changes in many legal functions will transform them into true partners with business offering advice that is more proactive evidence based and strategic teams will have to support the growing spectrum of risk compliance governance operation and regulatory issues so talent is therefore these will be required for these purposes training from law schools will be for these purposes and that is the nurturing of the balance that is needed between the students between the law schools and between the law firms ultimately for the service of clients there will be a need to process technology and skills to service the company's ongoing needs for practical legal advice it's not textbook advice it is practical legal advice and support the business with more efficiency more user friendly approaches and more focus on adding value let me now turn to the law firm discoveries in this period where there has been amazing amount of growth in in business and in the law what have the law firms discovered and for whom i think there are 10 grounds which i would like to touch upon patience is a true virtue you have to start at the bottom of the chain i remember when i started as a branch manager of my delhi branch that i used to go to the registry and make the notes on the orders in pencil because that was the norm today you get everything online we used to paginate briefs we used to get the uh, string attached with a big uh, iron uh, uh, almost like a nail and those were the experiences that we had when we started we didn't start on the basis that oh i'm going to be in such and such major case and that's all that i'm going to do and therefore i should not touch any of the basics patience is truly a virtue you must know everything from start to finish in a law firm menial tasks are essential to growth like proofreading it is essential you have to do it build and maintain your network this is something law firms find completely lacking in relation to students coming out from law school variety is the spice of life and you must have exposure which is all round you cannot say i'm going to be only a litigator i'm only going to be a finance lawyer you have to have a broad vision of everything because that everything is business and business is the center point of all law you should work abroad people should be exposed to a foreign posting i'll give you the example of japanese firms all their junior lawyers who are in line for a partnership are compulsorily made to go for one year in a preferred law firm to have experience to come to know the foreign firm's partners 
and to get a cultural change, a cultural shift from the country in which they are going to practice. The next issue is passion in the law. You cannot be a good lawyer without having passion. I remember the uh, movie Legally Blonde. At the end of the entire movie, there's a wonderful speech by uh, Reese Witherspoon on how the difference between an ordinary lawyer and an amazing lawyer is the passion in the law. You must make sure you have friends outside of the office. People who have a very narrow vision and who are only in the office tend to become political and abuse their presence by office politics. You have to trust yourself, step outside your comfort zone and challenge yourself. These are the kind of opportunities that a law firm must provide to law students. The millennials have taught us, don't sacrifice your personal life for professional life. Work-life balance is critical for preventing burnout. Lastly, stay healthy, both mentally and physically, because that is an essential thing in relation to the long-term uh, process that you will be undertaking. The future law firm, therefore, will be embracing technology. There will be a cultural shift, fit the job around people's lives. That's a very fundamental change when you say it, fit the job around people's lives. This has not been attempted in last several decades. Pivoting towards ESG, the whole climate change issue, the sustainability issue, the governance issue are critical issues as we are seeing in the kind of environmental change and damage which is being inflicted upon us. The lawyers have to lead the charge in pivoting towards ESG. And the last therefore issue is that law firms must take charge. They must lead the charge. See how many lawyers were in the Constituent Assembly when it came down to drafting the Constitution of India. Let me take the third limb of the proposition. Therefore, what does a student need? What are the skills that a student has to develop? And who has to provide those skills? I think it's a joint responsibility of the law school and the law firm to develop these skills for making better lawyers. And what are those skills? Learn how to listen. Every client wants a patient hearing and doesn't want an abrupt cut down when he's talking about his problem. Learn about the unintended consequences of lawyering, the impact on mental health. Learn how to nurture creativity. You have to be providing creative solutions, analytical solutions, and that is a part of the law college teachings as also the law firm working. How to have difficult conversations, sometimes with clients, sometimes with colleagues, because they are being obtuse. Conflict management skills. How do you manage conflict in a firm, conflict with reference to clients, conflict between clients and clients, conflict with teachers? How to be resilient. How can you be mentally strong to overcome the challenges in life, they overcome the challenges which you face at work? Next, how to run a law of practice. Students must know what it takes to be a law firm owner or a law firm manager or a group of partners leading a firm. I don't think they know that when they come out of college. How to manage their personal finances. Students in the initial years blow up their entire fund that they get in their very first year because they feel they have achieved life by joining a good law firm or getting money which they never expected in life. They have also to nurture an internal self, internal self of self-worth. 
there are so many students coming out of law schools who have terif- terrible confidence in their ability. They lack confidence completely. And you cannot do the practice of law without being confident. There has to be an emotional quotient in the learning of the law, and there must be interpersonal skills. So the issues that are summarized are technical knowledge and ability. This is one thing the law schools are not addressing. Interpersonal skills and emotional quotient. Ability to work collaboratively because they're always students are always competing with each other. And therefore, they only know how to hoard their own uh, things, whether it's studying a textbook or whether it is some notes that they have made. They don't tend to give it across unless they're really at the bottom of the class. A top student will never give you his notes. Increase business like thinking right from college one must think business. There must be negotiation skills that they must be taught. There must be financial management that the students need to be taught because that's going to be critical in the way you apply finance for the client's work. And lastly, but not the least, time management. Students have known in the education space or in their question and answers that they're given an exam that they can leave out a question. That is an impossibility in the practice of law. So they have to understand time management. The issues, again, as I said, from the student's perspective and what he has to gain is an analytical and evaluative skill, teamwork, written communication, how to even write letters, write petitions, write a document. These are very critical forms of written communications and they have even become more important with the work from home problem. A global mindset, a business sense, and organizational skills, passion for the law firm. If you don't care for the law firm, the law firm will not care for you. You have to have a commitment to the place you work. You have to have a commitment to the law school you go to. And without those commitments, you can never shine out or become a great lawyer. And lastly, every student needs a mentor. These are the sum and substance of the issues affecting law students. And it is this aspect which means nurturing the talent. In the topic that has been given to me, nurturing the right talent is about getting the right qualities and teaching the right qualities to the students. It's not just the law. It's not the technical subject. It is these personal skills which make the difference. I remember that in my first year of interviewing law school at Bangalore, we had the number one first class first student and both my brother Cyril and I were interviewing. It was our first ever interview of a law school ever. I'm talking there for 15, 20 years ago. The student came up to us and said that you better employ me. You better employ me because I will teach you how to run a law firm. Here was a guy who had just got five years of law school teaching and he told both the managing partners of the law school that I will improve your law firm. Even though he was the first, because he lacked humility, we rejected him. I think that is a critical issue that you must understand, that it takes all types of people to make a good lawyer and a good firm. And arrogance is one of the least qualities that a law firm aspires for. I want to read out a letter that a young student wrote to me in relation to Uh, uh, law colleges, law schools, and the profession. And it's a wonderful letter. I'll read excerpts of it. Law school is a bridge that connects students and the legal profession. One of the prime objectives of law schools is to prepare the students as best candidates for recruiters. Instead, law schools 
should focus on making a lawyer. I believe that the specific or particular set of skills that are required to work in a law firm or any other legal profession can definitely be acquired through the initial period of training that is offered by recruiters. But in order for this to be possible, law school should focus on equipping students with qualities that make them efficient to grasp and learn those specific skills at any given point. The underlying rationale is not just prepare students for a job or a career, but to impart them with knowledge and values that will stay with them forever. Law schools, therefore, should give more importance to imparting core lawyering skills in students rather than specific subject knowledge. This includes inculcating fundamental values of ethics, responsibility, and commitment. Students ought to realize that the law is not like any other desktop, but a unique and ethical profession where they as lawyers play a key role in shaping the society. This realization through special, core, special courses on core legal skills would prepare the students for any type of legal career they wish to pursue. And when it comes to law firms, what is important for the student is to have a good grasp over the subjects. It is essentially to make them understand as to what it really means to be a corporate lawyer and what their role entails. This can be achieved by conducting simulation exercises in law school so that students get to understand what they're signing up for in the future. This is where the role of law firms also becomes crucial. The landscape of law firms in India and across the world is radically evolving. Somewhere down the lane, students perceive law firms as competitive corporate jobs that come with its benefits. This perception results in them merely preparing to get placed and they do not aspire to achieve something bigger once they get the job. To resolve this, firms should help students see the bigger picture. The twin role law firms serve as economic and service institutions. Once students realize the service provided by firms adds significant value to the growth of society at large, the perception of their own careers will change. They will make them, this will make them understand their role, responsibility in the law firm with much better sense. Another important factor that widens the gaps between law schools and firms is the inability of students to adapt to the workplace atmosphere, increasingly its culture. The difficulty in adopting, adapting to the culture is a, is a result of several reasons. This is where the basic learning skills are needed for students to be able to make this responsibly. She goes on to state that internships are the key to understanding a culture of the law firm, because when you get an opportunity to work, you understand the qualities of the firm and the culture of the firm. Having said this from a student's perspective, Gayatri says that this is something which should be attended to by both law schools and law firms when they nurture the right talent. Two other people wrote to me and said, law schools still test memory skills and the rote method. They don't apply the Socratic method. They don't apply the analytic principles. There is much more of rote learning that is involved in law schools. His suggestion is, Test on how you apply the law. Where can you find the law? And therefore, teach them database management. Teach them software, which they will apply when they go to a law firm. There must be an ability to keep one's notes in a folder in the system, which they can rely upon and recourse for research papers. And therefore, his emphasis has been on the knowledge base. A professor from a school writes that structured teaching, learning, and evaluation is the critical aspect for any law school or university. Offering many electives, and this school had 110 electives, is critical to the growth of a student. 
there has to be a compulsory emphasis on legal research and the assessment about assessment should be about analytical thinking critical thinking and the problem solving ability and most important she writes community engagement and legal aid programs or giving back to society whether in the nature of pro bono or in the nature of um, esg activities or any form of returning back what the society has given to you is a critical element of learning the right qualities and the right values for a student so i think the four fold platform which i have revealed or stated all four have to work in unison ultimately to nurture the right talent from the law schools for the law firms it's not a one way problem it is a multi dimensional problem where all four pillars have to significantly contribute for the student and the ultimate consumer of the law the client thank you please give a bigger round of applause sir i don't think you know he is a stalwart there is a reason he was, he doesn't need to prepare a speech he's prepared a speech he's given it with passion delivered and i must tell you i went to a business school i went to an engineering school and then what you're saying a lot of things could be true for business school because some of the things for doing well in life and in any profession are true but i have three uh, so you know we have vice chancellor educator uh, i have three questions uh, and you can keep your questions ready if you have you won't get an access to mr shroff if you ask the good question maybe you'll remember your name maybe you'll get a job when i was in the business school i did that yes these are hacks i'm telling you this is not right so you talked about internships yeah. and um, i have a son who's in ninth class uh, so he wanted to do internship i sent it to two internships so he goes three days to one place in three days and that's a lot of pressure off my wife so uh, but the internships where so he goes to tech mahindra and he goes to go daddy so but they don't really give him any real work he's in class 9 he's 13 but do you the point i'm trying to do you give real work to students when i say i'm not talking of sam but i'm talking of us in industry figure are law firms giving real work to interns and what has changed in the last 25 26 months in terms of internships let me answer each one of the three questions that you've asked for a student who is in the 9th standard it is very difficult for such a young kid to really understand the law what we do when we have such requests no, no, he he doesn't go for law no, no i'm just giving an example of what a law firm did in such circumstances we had such children who wanted to come and look around at the firm and move from department to department just to understand whether they want to do law at a very early stage 9th standard 10th standard they wanted to make a career decision based on actual seeing how the work is how does it happen what is the culture like so they came and spent 10 days at the law firm just moving from department to department to understand whether it excites them to take up the law as a profession and we found it of immense use because those students actually did law so there is no nothing lost in giving a young student the opportunity of the sight of the workplace and the kind of people who are working there the second question yes we give actual work it's not only research briefs it's not just proofreading it's not just go photocopy this no they are put on actual work in relation to matters they need to examine the law research and provide a re research brief as to what case law could be relied upon say in an injunction matter so yes there is hardcore uh, legal work which is give, being given and they work with the team which are fully fledged experienced lawyers that's the way at least internship at our firm uh, is done the fundamental difference of what has happened uh, in the covid period is that internships have become virtual so the touch with the team the bonding that a student requires the teaching of uh, the mentoring that the student requires 
has weakened. And to that extent, students are losing out. But they get the learning, they do remote work, but they're missing out on making a team. They're missing out on a mentor telling them not this way, but this way. So thank you so much for being so real in that answer. Uh, my second question is, what do educators, what do professors who teach these young uh, budding professionals, what is the change in their own skills? What do they need to do up, to upgrade, to be relevant to what's happening in the environment? I think a significant change is needed by the law schools and the law firms. Even I'm not ready for this kind of future. Despite the fact that we've been running ahead of the curve, there is a lot for us to do. For example, the technology of law. I mentioned in my speech that a chief legal operations officer will be as important as a GC. What does that move mean? That systems education, how to update your knowledge in terms of what you had not learned in school and college of your time, the upgradation of your own knowledge. For example, if a question is asked in real life, as to what is the law in say Google's sentient computer. They have in the last three days, there are reports which say that a computer can think like an eight year old child and is responding as an eight year old child. So you have created artificial intelligence of a level of a school kid yeah, and I'm what are the legal that. issues? What would be the kind of questions which will arise on legal liability, legal uh, you know, enforceability, would the same laws as apply in the, in the field of natural persons apply in the field of, of uh, computer and art, artificial? These are stuff which is cutting edge and which people are learning. And that's the kind of stuff the students want. They don't want to hear and learn it in the chance that they get a good law firm where these issues will be researched and these issues, they don't have that chance. There, there will be hardly 10 law firms in the country who will give them that chance. Thank you, Mr. Shroff. Uh, I would like to, at this point, take one or two questions. If you have a question, raise your hand, give us your name, and ask a short question. We also have Mr. Pramod Dubey, who's a, who's a senior advocate and a very prominent criminal lawyer, also amongst uh, us. Give him a big round of applause. Uh, sir, please tell us who you are. Thank you. A short question. Good afternoon to all of you. Myself, Dr. Akbar Khan from Ikfai Law School, IFHA, Hyderabad. Sir, to be precise and specific in this aspect, as Sir said, uh, internship has become a mere formality now to be fulfilled because the student takes up actually one topic before getting into the internship firm. Then after entering the internship firm, he changes his topic. So he remains undecided and uncertain on the topic given. And one more point, sir, when it comes to the syllabus, why not the clinical papers be overall and upgraded as such to give more practical exposure to the students. The clinical papers like drafting, trading, convincing, professional ethics, ADR, moot court, so on and so forth. Why not add some more components? This is what I feel in specific to be done in order to give more practical inputs to the students. Sir, we got your question. All yours. Yeah. I think uh, speaking for myself, we don't follow this method of internship. We give the student one particular discipline to learn. We don't let the student shift from pillar to post. The student is given at least one month, if not more, to learn about the specific discipline of the law in which he is allocated. So he really learns something. If that student is given a, a pre-placement offer, which happens to many students at the firm, then the student is expected to come back to the firm on a second placement or a third placement in which he will again go with the same discipline to learn the subject. He's not going to hop around, but when he joins the firm, we give students opportunities of every fourth month changing the discipline. So a person, a student will get at least three subjects to learn in a practical deep way. At the stage of internship, because his knowledge is incomplete, we let the student come up to the required level of professional knowledge that he needs. We don't skit him around place to place. He's not just left to the chance of somebody taking an interest in him. 
there is an obligation on the team which requisitions him. In our firm, we actually ask the team leaders to say, do you want an intern? And if you don't want an intern, you'll not get one. But if you take an intern, you must promise to teach him something. You must promise to make use of him, not just give him a paid holiday. This is about exercising the, the skill set to actually learn whether the student is a good student. Just seeing a piece of paper and saying that, oh, your CGPA is so high is not enough. We've had cases where in group discussions while recruiting, the group discussion students have come out much better than people with high CGPA. And in relation to the practical, uh, your clinical courses, I agree with you totally. I don't have a difference in you on that. Thank you for asking that. Thank you. I hope you're satisfied. Uh, <laughs> He wants to ask a question. We'll come to you. Uh, Tell us what's your name? What do you do? Uh, sir, uh, I'm Tejasvi. I'm for a final student from NLU Shimla, and I have also a sub assessment at SAM also uh, with the real estate team. So my question is, how the use of data and you don't have a name? You don't want to market yourself? People spend a lot of money to market themselves. That's how media companies stay alive. Okay. So you have Tejasvi. What's your full name? Uh, Tejasvi Shukla. Yes. So, and you're in uh, which team? Uh, I was with the real estate with the Minal Kumar's team. Okay, really? Yeah. So uh, my question is how the data uh, use of data interpretation is going to shape the legal profession. And I have just a follow-up question also. Due to dynamic environment, there's an increase in vertical m &A and JVs. And as the president says, they are often unsuccessful. So how combining uh, data interpretation and a rigorous one with the you know practice of law is going to be you know affect them or improve them? This is something I just wanted to ask. So I have two answers to give you in the context of the two questions that you have raised. There is a whole science and IBM is one of the first to have started this, that upon feeding in judgments of particular judges, the computer can prepare and predict the outcome of any case. You do a history of the judgments of a particular judge right from the district court to the Supreme Court. See how the way his mind has moved see how the kind of decisions that he has given, feed that into a system, which is basically data gathering, data collection, data interpretation. And then you feed the live problem that you have. And based on the material that is in the system, the system sifts the output of a judge. It is the artificial intelligence and just machine learning, which brings the correct answer of how the judge will react. And this has been proved to be almost 90% correct. So it's a phenomenal advance of the law. That is why now in the United States of America and uh, elsewhere, they have an anal legal analytics as a study course, not merely for judgments, but about your clients. How do your clients, what, what client is going to come back to you? How many times has he come back to you? What is the value is fetched? All this is subject matter of legal analytics. So data is very critical. That's why everybody says data is the next oil. Why is there so much fight about data retention? Because it's a very valuable commodity. The second question you asked me just to give. Uh, it was all about vertical MNAs. Yeah, yeah. Vertical MNAs and uh, lateral horizontal MNAs are ultimately matters of scrutiny in competition law. Vertical MNAs are proved to show that there is a more appreciable adverse effect on competition. And therefore, they are scrutinized with higher degree of scrutiny than a horizontal uh, merger. That's the, that's the law as a process. Thank you, Mr. Shroff. Uh, the lady also wants to ask a question. Short question, your name, what do you do? All right. uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Prashansa Singh and I'm from Campus, Campus Law Center Faculty of Law Duke. Uh, so, sir, I have two questions. So, for, so, my first question is, as a starting law student, what should I have in my arsenal to say secure an internship at a firm like yours? So at, at the cost of sounding like an idiot and not like that Bangalore student, 
what is it that we should possess to actually have a tangible internship because as i'm just starting out the legal world seems quite bleak because it's a very cutthroat competition people are doing multiple internships so you are supposed to be quite lost when you're just starting out so how do i tackle that my second question is uh, regarding the pedagogy our curriculums are not in tandem with uh, what is required of us in the legal world we are not prepared to deal with actual legal issues uh, got got it prashant there's something on twitter short 144 correct uh, uh, so so just okay. i mean i'll try to keep it quite short but sir these problems have existed for decades these are the structural problems which all of us have tackled you have tackled what are realistic steps that we can take cuz it seems quite bleak right now cuz these are going to persist for a very long time we read bwlegalworld.com we'll open up a channel for internships uh, all right i will i will sir thank so, you Pat, i think mr uh, shroff i just wanted to comment in lighter way that if in india you did analytics on judges and their past judgment their future judgment may still not add up to what the analytics show but that's in a lighter note uh, i agree with you but I now prashansa's to... question in your answer yeah uh, prashansa no yes sir let me tell you what the problem is there with the with the law firms they are of limited capacity the ratio of a partner to a student or the lowest entry is 1 is to 4 so if we have 100 people we can have 400 interns or we can have 400 uh, lawyers of which the intern is the last in the row in the queue on an average a law firm even of our size cannot take more than 60 interns we have about 20 law schools and universities applying to us that means we can on an average take only two students if we have to give a balanced approach to internship from every college which is empaneled with us we can give a right to only two people therefore obviously there is going to be an intense competition in uh, joining the fact that a student has done multiple uh, training is not the issue what kind of learning has the person had what is his social background in the sense is he a sports player is he a music lover is he a reader all those issues matter to us because it shows us the mind of a person it shows us how laterally expanded that person is and the ability to therefore think laterally it's not just about the cgpa that has emerged cgpa is certainly an important uh, criteria for us to select because we cannot afford to have the last person in the class joining us it Thanks. costs us 25 lakhs for a single student coming out of a college multiply that by 60 and you will understand how much cost a law firm engages like ours i don't speak about others in just getting interns and what happens in real life is that while 60 come from colleges there are 40 more who join the firm at various levels they come as laterals whether at level of a principal associate or a junior associate or an a0 and we have to accommodate them based on their skill set i have even refused children of judges who refused to go through the internship so sitting method. or retired sitting okay <laughs> sitting so it doesn't matter you have to go through the it's a merit based entry so if you don't want to go in on the merit based then don't come and prashant sir on a serious note just to it's also the personality see one of the things that i've heard from him is passion um uh, you know communication skills what do you do beyond work so you know at the end of the while your legal my cgpa was decent but i was not top of the class but and the only alumnus from my business school 20000 alumnus uh, on the board of my school okay so it is loss of hair also can get you on the board that's what i'm trying to tell you but it's the personality okay how hard you work how what is the contribution apart from learning in that internship could you help mr shroff or whoever you work with with something that they appreciate which is of real value that he, you go beyond the extra you're extraordinary that's what you look for yeah, yeah commitment you know 
passion well, for the firm if there are 40 interns and they have to hire four people what is what is that about that four people you know it has to be something special so communication skills the fact that you asked a question uh, and you asked an intelligent and real question shows that there is something extra you have right at least people know you now right i know your name is prashant sir right and you talked of bangalore wait for our ratings uh, rankings you have a surprise in rankings so i'll leave it at that please give us a show of a big round Ross, he has many more questions coming. Uh, okay, Ms. the gentleman wants to ask the last question. We, I don't know. I don't know the gentleman. He hasn't paid me, but you can pay me after the. Good question. afternoon, sir. My name is Vineet, and I'm a lawyer myself. Well, it's been almost seven years I'm into this profession. So, as we all know, that the dynamics of the advisories have changed a lot. So these days, all clients are looking forward to business solution rather than legal solution. So, especially in the relation to the fact they need a business answer. Now, the setting करके दे दो. नहीं, I'm kidding. I don't know what I. So, sir, what should be the way forward so that we end up advising the client within the law, so that they cater to their business needs and and at the same time ensuring the legal requirements. I think I mentioned this in my presentation that every lawyer has to have some business sense. You cannot be a corporate commercial lawyer without having a business sense. And there are clear demarcations of where the students go. Either they go into further studies, either they want to do the Legal education space, or they want to litigate, or they want to be corporate lawyers. Different different fields of law get involved when you are actually in the process of coming out from college. There is not just one stream that people will only go to corporate law. Now, the ethical rule is that if a person is asking for an extra legal solution, a non legal solution, as a firm of our repute, we would say no. We have said no in many cases that this is not something we will do. Go to another person. Don't ask us this question. We will give a legal way out if there is a legal way, fitting the facts, and that is the way to practice the law. I have not practiced the law with cutting corners. Thank you, Mr. Shroff. Uh, there are many questions. Professor from Subharti wants to ask what we'll address, but please give Mr. Shroff a big round of. Mr. Shroff, there's a memento for you. Just don't go. It's something that you like. It's in liquid form, but it's not what you think. It's coffee. Uh, so uh, we want to give you uh, a small hamper. Please, uh, you know, we live in a Facebook and a social media area. We'll need a photo with you. Garima and Ashima can give you the memento. Please give Mr. Shroff a big round of applause. Uh, He's been very supportive. There are many other questions. I'll address them in the next. Uh, if you can be in the center, so that yes, Mr. Shroff should feel that he's really wanted and we appreciate. It. Can you make him feel a little more warm? Yeah.